Okay, good morning. So nice to see all of you. Baruch Hashem here for the Shi'ur with just a few days, a few hours before Pesach. So kol to all of you who've taken the time during this very busy season with all the Pesach prep. This morning I'd like to explore together with you the bracha of Asher Ge'alanu, called by some Rishonim the Birkat Hagi'ula, the blessing of redemption. It's the bracha with which we conclude the Magid portion of the Seder and the first half of the Hallel, which we'll see for the first part of Hallel. And it's the bracha that introduces the second cup of wine. And we'll see that it really plays a pivotal role, really, uh, an essential role in the overall structure of the Haggadah Shel Pesach and has some special significance this year after this year when Erev Pesach falls out on Shabbat and the Seder is held on Motzei Shabbat. And I believe that this bracha, the Birkat Gula, has tremendous significance and relevance and resonance for us, the generation that is so blessed to see the miraculous birth of the state of Israel and, and really all of the wonders and miracles here that are taking place today in the United Israel. So here I'll put up on the screen for us all to explore some sources. Trust you can all see the source sheets. Okay. So this is the bracha of Asher Ge'alanu as it appears in most Haggadot. This, this is the the standard version of this bracha. There are different nuschaot, slight different variations, uh, as with many different parts of the Haggadah. Haggadah is a text that really evolved over centuries. Um, and, and so maybe we'll explore together some of the different girsaot and some of the textual anomalies and some of the variations or variant texts. But this is the, the standard nusach of the bracha that appears in most Haggadot. And what are, we, what are we blessing Hashem? Okay, let's first examine the actual meaning of the bracha, and then uh, lat lat will take apart the structure of the bracha, the, uh, the, the anomalies uh, and, and uh, curiosities in this bracha, and we'll look at the role it plays in the overall structure of the Haggadah, because it really plays such an essential role or a pivotal role in the Haggadah Shel Pesach. So we're saying, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the Universe, Asher Ge'alanu ve'ge'al et avoteinu mitzrayim, who has redeemed us and our forefathers from Egypt. Now, interesting, we'll come back to this. Interesting that the bracha begins, Asher Ge'alanu, he redeemed us. It could have been just Asher Ga'al et Avotenu Mitzrayim, right? But the bracha begins, you've redeemed us and our forefathers, our ancestors from Egypt. Not just them, but us too. It's very important. V'higyanu halayla hazeh. And we've come to this night. Hashem, you brought us to this night. Le'echol bo matzah maror. To eat matzah and maror. Okay? Now, this next word, Ken, is a very pivotal word within the bracha itself, and we're going to come back to this. So too, Hashem, our God and the God of our forefathers, bring us to future holidays and festivals and peace. So that we can there in the uh, rebuilt city, we can happily celebrate with the rebuilt Yerushalayim, and we will rejoice in your service. This is a reference to the service in the Beit HaMikdash, the service in the Holy Temple. And there we will eat from the Zvachim, from the Korbanot, and from the Korban Pesach. Now, in most Haggadot, you have this note in parentheses or brackets or a little asterisk telling you that on Motzei Shabbat, here, Motzei Shabbat, min hapsachim umin hazvachim, that when Pesach falls out on Saturday night, you change the order. And first you say, we will 
we should be zochet to return to your holy city, the rebuilt city of Yerushalayim, and, and there we will rejoice and serve you with joy, and there we will be zochet to eat from the psachim and the zvachim, the korban pesach, and then the other korbanot. We'll explain why there's this reversal, why we change the words, why we flip the order when Pesach falls out on Motzei Shabbat. Okay, and then the bracha continues, Asher yagia damam al kir mizbachecha l'ratzon, the offerings, the zvachim, the psachim, whose blood reaches your altar, v'ratzon, uh, in a pleasing way to you, we know that the uh, different various korbanot, the, the blood was either sprinkled, or for instance, the korban Pesach, the blood of the korban Pesach was poured on the Yisod HaMizbeach, the foundation of the Mizbeach, the foundation of the altar. And, v'noda, and there, v'noda lecha shir chadash al geulatenu v'al pedut nafshenu. And there, we will sing a new song. We will thank you, Hashem, v'noda lecha, with a new song, Al Gulatenu for our redemption, for our deliverance, the Alptut Nafshenu. And for the deliverance or the redemption of our souls, Baruchata Hashem Gaal Yisrael. Blessed are you, Hashem, who has redeemed Israel. So just at first glance, it's fascinating. This bracha thanks Hashem for what? It thanks Hashem for Yitziat Mitzrayim. Okay, it, it, as we'll see, mentions the past. Okay, it's thanking Hashem for the past, but also looking towards the future, for the future redemption. We're thanking Hashem for the redemption from Egypt, the exodus from Egypt, but we're looking towards the ultimate and final redemption. Okay, and it would seem that, you know, this bracha, it, it seems to mix or, or conflate or confuse past with present and future. Because interestingly, we're going to come back to this point as well. How does the bracha end? Okay, we're, we're starting with discussing Egypt, and then we move towards the future, but then it ends, Baruch Hashem Ga'al Yisrael, in past tense. We thank Hashem, or bless Hashem, for redeeming Israel, Ga'al, in past tense. Okay, so so uh, keep those things in mind, that this bracha is linking the past with the present and the future, and maybe even confusing and conflating the past with the present and the future. And that's important, as we'll see later this morning. But before we, we uh, return to the reasons for the, uh, the different tenses, if you will, in this bracha and the role it plays, I, I want to just focus for a few moments on this change that we make when the, the Seder falls out on Saturday night, as it's especially relevant this year, as the Pesach Seder falls out on Motzei Shabbat. And we make this change, and instead of saying, the Haggadah tells us to change it from that to mina psachim umina zvachim, to flip the order, to change the order. <coughs> Excuse me. It's, uh, <coughs> Hashem, it's, it's Pesach season. Spring is here. It's a time for renewal and redemption, but it's also allergy season. <laughs> now, uh, the Nusach, with, with some minor variations of this bracha, is found in the Mishnah in the 10th chapter of Masechet Pesachim. That is the source for this bracha. And we'll return to this Mishnah. But the Mishnah there just says, shamina umina psachim. The Mishnah doesn't tell you to make any changes when the Seder falls out on Motzei Shabbat. It just says, and there we will eat from the Zvachim, from the Korbanot, and from the Pesachim. Okay, that's the, the uh, Mishnah as we have it according to most manuscripts of the Mishnah. But what's interesting is there are different girsa'ot and different versions of this Mishnah in the Talmud Bavli and in the Yerushalmi and other sources. So if you take a look here at source number three, this is where the Talmud Bavli cites the Mishnah. And you see from these parentheses and brackets here that the Bavli recognizes that there are different editions and different versions, different girsa'ot, of the way the Mishnah appears in the Talmud Bavli. Okay, first it says, and then you have here in parentheses a correction. No, it should be. So that is there to, to key us into the fact that there are different gears. Oh, there are different versions, different editions of the way the Talmud Bavli quotes the Mishnah. In some editions of the Talmud Bavli, it quotes the Mishnah, with the Korban Pesach first. In other editions, 
It's no, mina zvachim u mina psachim, as we have it in the Mishnah in source number two. Okay, so they're different additions. And the way the Mishnah appears in the Talmud Yerushalmi is here in source number four, v'sham nochal min ha-psachim u min ha-zvachim, with the Korban Pesach first. Okay, so there are different versions, different girsaot. Now, Tosfot, there on the Bavli, here in source number five, explains that the correct addition should be, as we have it in our standard Mishnah, where the zvachim comes first, and Tosfot explains why. Tosfot here, where I've underlined, writes the following. This is Tosfot, and Daf Kuf Tet Zayin Amud Bet, in source number five. Tosfot writes, Vigar Sinan Sham Min HaZvachim Umin HaPsachim. The correct girsa, the correct addition, should be Min HaZvachim Umin HaPsachim, with the Zevach, with the Korbanot, we'll, we'll see in a moment which Korban this refers to, but Tosfot explains the correct addition should be mina zvachim u mina psachim. Why? Shechagigat arba asa nechelet kodem la pesach. Oh, you know why? Because in the nusach of this bracha, when we talk about the zvachim, what zvachim are we talking about? It's a reference to the chagigat arba asar, to the festive offering, which was brought on the 14th of Nisan. Now, when one comes on aliyah l'regel, when one comes to the Beit HaMikdash for one of the Shalosh Regalim, one has to bring in Olat Riyah, Shalmei Simcha, and Shalmei Chagiga. Now this Korban Chagiga that was brought on Pesach was brought on Erev Pesach on the 14th. Why? Because it was eaten before the Korban Pesach. Why? Tosfot explains because the Gemara says, Sheha Pesach Ne'echal Al Hasova. The Korban Pesach has to be eaten once you are full, once you are satiated, not completely full. You know, you have to leave some room over for the Korban Pesach. Like we say, you have to leave some room over for uh, the Afikomen, the Afikomen, which represents or symbolizes the Korban Pesach. So, so too, you have to leave over for, uh, you, you have to eat, excuse me, the, the, you have to leave over some space for the Korban Pesach, but the Korban Pesach has to be eaten al hasov. So what would they do? They would bring the Chagigat Ba'asar, this special festive offering, the Korban Chagigat, they would bring it on the 14th, and they would eat it during the first part of the Seder. And they would get a little full on this Chagigat Ba'asar, and then they would eat the Korban Pesach afterwards, because the Korban Pesach has to be in Al Hasova. Now, there's a whole discussion as to, you know, why the the, uh, the Korban Chagiga comes first. Some say maybe it's Tadir, Vishenu Tadir, Tadir Kodem. You bring the Korban Chagiga three times a year. The Korban Pesach only comes once a year. But Tosfa says, no, it's because the Korban Pesach has to be eaten once you were satiated already. So you got full on your Chagiga and then you had your Korban Pesach. And that's why, and this is so important to understand, that's why, according to Tosfos, the nusach of the bracha is that we're going to eat in Yerushalayim from the zvachim and then from the psachim. First from the zevach, first from the chagigat arba asar, right? That's the proper order. And then we'll have the korban pesach towards the end of the meal. Now, the Mordechai says the same thing here in source number six, but he asks a question. He says, oh, well, actually, uh, he, he adds another element too from the Talmud Yerushalmi. This is also very interesting. He says, yeah, the reason why, he says, like Tosfos, uh, that the proper order of the blessing, the proper nusach, should be min hazvachim u min apsachim, for the reasons we explained, the reason Tosfos explains, because first you're going to have your chagigat ar ba'asar, and only then, after the Korban Pesach, and he adds another element from the Talmud Yerushalmi. He says, ubi Yerushalmi mifaresh ta'ama, Another nikuda, another point that the Yerushalmi makes mention of that there's a, a Torah prohibition to break bones while eating the Korban Pesach. Okay? And some explain that the reason is we are no longer slaves. Right? At the Seder, we are free men. Tonight, we are free men. And free men don't break bones and suck out marrow. Slaves, poor people, you know, they, they, they barely get a piece of meat. So, you know, they eat over the leftover bones and they gnaw on the bones, they chew on the bones, they break them open, they suck out the marrow. But wealthy people toss that away. So that's how many explain this isur of shvirat etzem, that you're not allowed to break any bones while eating the Korban Pesach. So the Talmud Yerushalmi explains, oh, that's another reason. Now, some explain that it actually is the same reason. 
right? In other words, the reason why the Korban Pesach is eaten at the end of the Seder, once you've had your Chagiga, is because, yeah, you shouldn't be so hungry for the Korban Pesach. Why? Because if you were really ravenous, imagine if you eat it at the beginning of the meal and you're so ravenous, you can just, you know, uh, especially, you know, the, the Seder takes a long time. By the time you get to the, the meal, you're hungry already. So you're going to just eat and you're going to maybe break bones. So it could be that it's the same reason, really, that, you know, the reason the, the reason why the Talmud Rushalmi explains that the Korban Pesach has to be in Alasova like the Bavli is so that you not come to break any bones, because if you're so ravenous, you might come to break bones. If you've already eaten your Korban Chagiga, if you already you got some food in your belly, you're not going to need to break any bones. You're not going to be that hungry. So it could be that it's actually two sides of the same coin. It's really the same answer. But the Mordechai understands it a little bit differently because he asks the question, he says, you know, we find by Kochim and the Korban Chagiga is uh, what we would consider Kochim. He says that we find that Korban Chagiga or, or Kochim, Rather, he brings a, a Gemara in Tmura. He says, Kotchim also are Nechalin al Hasova. That also, when you eat Kotchim, you have to have a little food in your belly. You shouldn't eat them while ravenous. So he explains, therefore, the Talmud Yerushalmi has to give an additional reason, this reason of Shvirat Etzem. Okay, that's, that's what the Mordechai says at the bottom here, at the end of the passage. Uh, right, but it's two reasons. Korban Pesach is, has to be in Alasova, as we've explained. But he says, well, but the Chagiga should also be in Alasova. Oh, so therefore, so the Yerushalmi adds another reason, that you're not come to break any bones. Okay, but what, what's important for our purposes this morning is that according to Tosfos, according to the Mordechai, the reason for the Nusach, the Nochasham, Min HaZvachim, Min HaPsachim, is because we're going to eat first the Chagigat Arba'asar. We're going to eat the Zevach. We're going to get full on this special festive offering. And only then we're going to eat the Korban Pesach at the end of the meal. Once we've got some food our, food in our belly, therefore, uh, they explain the reason for the order, okay? That you say, Mina Zvachim, Umin HaPesachim. Now, based on that, based on that, okay, what happens in a year like this when Pesach falls out on Motzei Shabbat and Leil HaSeder is Saturday night? Now, we learned two weeks ago that the Korban Pesach is Doche Shabbat. The Korban Pesach is brought and offered on Shabbat. Okay, if uh, Pesach, or if Erev Pesach falls out on Shabbat as it does this year, they would bring the Korban Pesach and offer it in the Beit HaMikdash because Korban Pesach takes precedence. It's Doche Shabbat. Okay, special, special din by Korban Pesach. There's a lot of discussion in the Mishnah, the Gemara. We touched on a little bit of it. So they would bring it on Shabbat on the 14th of Nisan, and they would eat it on Motzei Shabbat. But what about the Chagigat Arba'asar? So if you recall, the only korbanot, as we said two weeks ago, when we discussed the ability to bring korbanot Bizman Azeh and Dafka Korban Pesach nowadays, we said that only a korban that is Kavua Lozman, that has a, a specific time restriction, it has an established time. It can only be brought on a specific day. Only those types of korbanot are doche Shabbat and doche Tum'ah. We spoke at length about the fact that the korban Pesach is brought even when the Jewish people are in a state of Tum'ah, even when they're all impure, either the majority of the people or the majority of the Kohanim or the Kelim, as we saw two weeks ago. So the korban Chagiga, the festive offering, need not be brought on the 14th. It could be brought the next day. It could be brought on the 15th. In fact, if a person, typically you'd bring the Olat Re'iyah, the Shami Simcha, the Korban Chagiga, you'd bring them on the first day. But if you didn't, you have the entire week of the festival as Tashlumim to bring those offerings. So the Korban Chagiga need not be brought on the 14th. It could be brought the next day. It could be brought on the 15th and eaten on the 15th. So in a year like this, when Erev Pesach, when Yud Dalit Nisan falls out on Shabbat, yes, they would bring the Korban Pesach because they have to bring it on the 14th. That's the mitzvah. It can only be brought on the 14th and it has to be eaten on the night of the 15th. But the Korban Chagiga could be brought the next day. So they would not bring the Chagigat Arba'asar when Erev Pesach falls out on Shabbat like it does this year. Now, 
we said the Korban Pesach has to be eaten al hasova. It's nechal al hasova. You have to ha have some food in your belly. Okay, so they would, you know, fill up on some other things. They would have some, you know, chicken soup with matzo balls, plenty of things to fill up on before you eat your Korban Pesach in order to be able to eat it al hasova. You need not eat the chagigat arba asar. Okay, we eat it to, to fill your belly a little bit. And we explain why that comes first, maybe, when uh, we, we need to eat both of those things. But uh, but when Pesach falls out in Motzei Shabbat, so you fill, on, uh, fill up on something else. It could also be that, you know, uh, when Pesach uh, falls out in Motzei Shabbat, as it does this year, so you go into the Seder Benachas, right? You get a chance to shluff a little bit, to rest up a little bit, to prepare some divrei Torah. You're not running around like a chicken without a head, Erev Pesach, like we, we typically do. So it could be they were also, you know, after Shabbat, they were already a little bit full. You know, maybe they'd eaten, you know, they'd had a shal of shudas. You can't have, right? You can't have, you can't have matzah, <laughs> of course. You can't have bread at that point. You can't have matzah, or Pesach. Uh, so the whole question is, what do you do for shal of shudas? Right? Hopefully you've covered that in other shiurim where your rabbi, like, like I did, sent out an email about what to do this, uh, this Shabbat for Shalosh But it could be they went into Pesach, you know, with already some food in their belly already from Shabbos, and they eat something else at the Seder. Okay, so on a year like this, when Erev Pesach falls out on Motzei Shabbat, and the 14th of Nisan is on Shabbat, they would not bring the Chagigat Arba Asar on Erev Pesach. Okay, so therefore, the Mahari Vail here in source number seven, in a lengthy tshuva, very lengthy tshuva about all different issues related to Pesach, he says the following. He says, Kishiyo Pesach b'motzei Shabbat, when Pesach falls out on Saturday night, as it does this year, az yomar min ha-pesachim u-min Oh, he's the first one to say that we should flip the order. Right? Why? De'en chagigat kreva b'shabbat. Because you would not bring the chagigat ar ba'asar on Shabbat. So in other words, this year, you're going to eat the Korban Pesach first and only then get to the Zvachim. So therefore, in the bracha, you should say, min ha-psachim u min ha-zvachim, because this year the Pesach is coming first. The Korban Pesach is going to be in first before your Korban Chagiga. U belel sheni, now if you're in Chutz La'aretz, okay, and you're having a Seder there, which is already on Sunday night. So belel sheni, yamer min ha-zvachim u min ha-psachim. There, you uh, would return to the original order, says the Mari Vail. Why? Because the uh, Chagiga Nechal Kodem Pesach. because by then, uh, already on the 15th of Nisan, on the first day of Yom Tov, they could have brought the Chagiga, the Korban Chagiga. It wouldn't be called the Chagiga Terbasar if you bring it on the 15th, but they would bring their festive offering. And then already the second night of Pesach, they, you know, they're not making a second Seder in, uh, in Yerushalayim, of course, but you know, it could be other parts of Eretz Israel where, you know, the, the, the messengers wouldn't have time to get to, uh, even when the Beit HaMikdash stood. Even in Eretz Israel, there were places that maybe kept two days of Yom Tov. But in any case, the Mari Vile is living in 15th century Germany, a very, very important uh, post sake one of the important Chachmei Ashkenaz of that period. He was a very close Talmud of the Maharil. And, you know, the... the uh, Piske Halacha and the Minhagim that the Maharil records and the Marivail records all become very, very important for Ashkenazic practice. So he's the first one to mention this. It's when it, it falls out on Motzei Shabbat, when Pesach falls out on Motzei Shabbat, and they would not have brought the Chagigat Basar and the Beit HaMikdash, so you switch the order in the Bracha. Okay, you switch the order, and instead of saying, Min HaZvachim u Min HaPsachim, you say no. Min ha-psachim u min ha-psachim. Because this year you're going to eat the Korban Pesach first. And then in the Chutzlar, it's or, you know, on the second night where you're going to have your, your second Seder. So then already you can return to the original Nusach. Why? Because the Korban Chagiga could already be brought on the 15th. And he says, And that's the din by other, by, by, by uh, regular years, by other years. Meaning in most years. In a typical year, the order should be, as we had it in the Mishnah, min ha-zvachim u min ha for the reason we saw in Tosfos and in the Mordechai, that typically, in a typical year, the zevach, the chagigat ar ba'asar, comes first before the Korban Pesach. Okay, so this year we switch it, and uh, that's brought down la by the Bach here in source number eight, and by the Mogin of Ram, and, uh, and by the Taz, and uh, the Mishnah Brura in his Shart Siyun, Okay, so this is this is a typical practice, and uh, most posts can say that when Pesach falls out on Motzei Shabbat, as it does this year, we should switch 
like we had it here in source number one, like we saw in a typical Haggadah, we should switch the order and say, mina psachim mina zvachim, because you would not bring the zevach, you would not bring the chagigat erbaasar, instead you'd eat the korban pesach first before you'd get to the zevach. Yeah, and that's how, uh, uh, that's, that's what appears in most Haggadot, and that's what most posts can say. However, some of the Achronim uh, uh, say, first of all, and this is very interesting, the Mishnah and the Gemara, they make no mention falls out on Motzei Shabbat, okay? And this is the, the typical girsa that you have, the, the addition that No sound. I lost sound. Everybody lost it. Yeah. He'll come back. He'll be back. Okay. Just uh, maybe we'll put everyone on mute. Okay. Can Can you hear me? If yeah. Yes. If we okay. mute, you can't hear us. Okay. Okay. So uh, I, I don't know where we got cut off, but. Um, as I said, it's interesting, the Mari Vail is the first one to mention, to switch the order. Uh, the Mishnah, which gives us the Nusach of this Bracha, the Gemara, and all the Rishonim, none of them tell you to switch the order. This is the gear so that appears in the Rif, the Rush, the Rambam, all the major Rishonim. And even while, as we saw, Tosfos and the Mordechai explain why this is the proper girsa and why this is the proper order. They don't tell you to switch the order around when Pesach falls out on Motzei Shabbat. So it's, 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 a, it's really a question, really, really uh, a question. And Rav Yaakov Emden, for instance, who is, you know, someone who can Kodesh, he, Know, is someone who's interested in, in preserving the sort of authentic and, and proper uh, menog and halacha and, and looking at, you know, the authoritative text and find that, you know, like the Ligon and others as well. Rav Yaakov Emden mentions, no, you don't make that the reason for the nusach of this bracha. This bracha is composed based on rov hashanim, based on most years. He writes this in his Sidur, in his commentary to the Sidur, Sidur Ya'abetz. He writes that the proper nusach should be min hazvachim umin apsach. Because this was composed for rov hashanim, for the majority of the years, for typical years when the chagiga precedes the korban pesach. So uh, Rav Yaakov Emden was against making this change that the Mari Vile suggests. And others as well. In fact, in his shar at Siyun, the, uh, the Mishnah Brura quotes the Knesset Yechezkel, uh, who was the Knesset Yechezkel. The Knesset Yechezkel was Yechezkel Katz and Ellenbogen. For those of you who live in Harnof, like I do, we know that, uh, that name very well, very important rabbinic family. Uh, he was the Rav of, uh, of the tripartite community Ahu. It stands for Altona Hamburg Bonsbeck, very important Jewish community. Uh, he was uh, born in 1667. And uh, again, the Katzen family, very important rabbinic family. Um, and uh, we have this, this big street named for him here in Harnof. But in any case, so here in uh, source number 12, the Mishnah Brura quotes the Knesset Yechezkel. And he writes, I am the Ayin Shuvat Knesset Yechezkel, Sof Chelek or Achayim, Mashapire Shams. What he explains over there. She'en midaktakim bekach. He says, you don't, we don't have to be midactic. We don't have to make this change like the Mari Vial suggests. Oh, says something very important. The Knesset Yecheskel says, you don't make any changes. Why? Because the whole bracha is looking towards the future when we'll be zocheh to rejoice and celebrate as we saw 
the shir, the whole nusach of the bracha is that we should be zocha to rejoice and celebrate in the Beit HaMikdash. So we're looking forward to future years. So the Knesset Yecheskel, and here the, in source number 13, the Shulchan Aruch Harav, the Balatani, and his Shulchan Aruch, also explains that the Nusach HaBracha is not about this year when Pesach happens to fall out on Motzei Shabbat. No, no, no. We're talking about future years when we'll be able to be Zochet to celebrate in the Beit HaMikdash and eat the uh, eat from the Zvachim and eat from the Pesachim and offer that Chagigat Arba Asar. And the Shulchan Al-Harav, the Balatani, adds an interesting point. He says that it could be, you know, Mitzvah Shem next year, what? We will, we will celebrate Pesach. It won't be on, on a Motzei Shabbat. He says, yeah, now this year we celebrate with, uh, you know, Im al pi cheshbon hakviyut hamustar biadenu, right? He says, yeah, with our fixed calendar, um, we are celebrating on Motzei Shabbat. So, okay, fine. So you wouldn't have the Korban Chagiga in such a year. But he says, but when Mirza Shem, Sheibana Beit HaMikdash, right? We're going to have a Beit HaMikdash and we're going to restore we're going to have witnesses that see the new moon and we're going to take testimony and we're going to establish the calendar based on that. Okay. And it could be that it's not going to fall out on Motzei Shabbat when they take testimony. Okay. So both the Knesset Yecheskel and the Balatanya and his Shulchan Aruch are explaining that this bracha is about the future. Okay, we're going to come back to that and, and ask, what is this bracha really about? Is it about the past? Is it about the future? What's it about? Okay, but what's what's fascinating is that according to Achronim, this whole mishigas about changing the order is rooted in a ta'ut sofer. It's rooted in a scribal error. Okay, this is something that Baruch HaLevi Epstein writes in his Sefer Baruch She'amar, which was his autobiography, multi-volume autobiography, where he speaks about, uh, you know, the Nitziv, actually a portion of it was translated into English, very controversial volume that uh, was, was uh, uh, taken out of circulation, My Uncle the Nitziv, for those of you who are familiar with that whole story and that controversy. But he writes a lot of, of incredible things, a lot of strange things, incredible things about his family and about different uh, Rabbonim and his life. Life and, and also a lot of divrei Torah. And one of the things he does there, he loves to do this. He loves to point out that some of the changes that we make in the Nusach are actually rooted in mistakes, in scribal errors, in misinterpretations or misunderstandings of notes on, on uh, manuscripts or rooted in some variation, some variant text. Okay, so, so he writes the following here in source number 14. Uh, I'll just summarize it for the sake of time. This is in the third volume of his Sefer Baruch She'amar. Uh, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Rav Baruch HaLevi Epstein was the son of the Aruch HaShulchan, Yechiel Michal Epstein, okay? Rav Baruch HaLevi Epstein was the son of the Baal Aruch HaShulchan. And um, he tried to become a Rav in, in Europe and the United States and was really unsuccessful at finding a position as a Rav, but, um, you know, he, he, uh, he was a bookkeeper and uh, he was in, in business. He became a businessman, and, uh, but, but was, was uh, very prodigious and, and wrote a lot of things. And some of the things that he writes are controversial for different reasons without getting into it now. But there's a lot of, a lot of interesting scholarship on Rav, uh, Baruch HaLevi Epstein. He was definitely a very unique rabbinic personality. Unfortunately, uh, when the Nazis came into Pinsk, where he was living, they blew up the Jewish hospital. They blew it up, they burnt it down. And he was at the time in the hospital. He was hospitalized at the time. And unfortunately, uh, Nebuch, he, he was nifter there in uh, 19. 41 when the Nazis burned down the, the hospital in Pinsk. But a very, very fascinating rabbinic personality. So he writes the following. You know, he, he makes all these uh, diukim, you know, migdol, magdol, magdil, like in the benching, we make this change, magdil, migdol. He says that is maybe rooted in some mistake or misunderstanding. He says that also here in this, uh, in this chapter. But uh, what's important for our purposes this morning, he writes the following. He says that, you know what? As we saw, there were different editions, uh, there were different versions, variant versions, variant girsaot, variant text, textual anomalies of the way this Mishnah appears in the Bavli and in the Yerushalmi, right? And uh, different Yishonim have it different ways. Min ha-psachim u min min ha-psachim min ha-psachim. So he claims that, you know what it was? That some, uh, some copyist 
is looking over a manuscript of the Haggadah, and he makes himself a little note on the side and the margin there. And he writes, Mem Shin, okay, Mem Shin, or maybe Bet Mem Shin, to mean Bimishnah Shebegmara, as the Mishnah appears in the Gemara, or perhaps Bet Mem Shin, Bimishnah Shebi Yerushalmi, right? according to some, he's not the only one who says this, it, maybe the abbreviation was Mem Shin Bet Mishnah Shebi Yerushalmi, okay, the way the Mishnah appears in Yerushalmi, where the Pesach comes first, Mina Psachim Mina Zvachim, okay? And what happened was, you know, he, he, this copyist makes himself a note on the Haggadah, oh, is where the Pesach comes first. And according to Baruch HaLevi Epstein, and he's not the only one that says this, um, it's attributed as well to Rabbi Cheskel Abramsky. It is also attributed by Rav Maimon to the Gra in his Sefer Toldot HaGra, his biography of the Gra, where he records a lot of Divrei Torah of the Gra. Now, uh, you know, Rav Maimon was also an interesting rabbinic figure, and it's not always so clear where he gets his material about the Gra, and uh, he's been accused of, you know, kind of cutting and pasting different things, but in any case, it's definitely a beautiful Sefer. He places this uh, idea also in the mouth of the Gra, but the Gra doesn't say it anywhere in his comments to the Shulchan Aruch, or doesn't say it uh, you know, in his emendations or any, it's not in the Maiseh Rav, which records his uh, Minhagim and his Dibrei Torah. It doesn't appear anywhere in the, in the literature of the Gra, but uh, Rav Maimon records this also that um, the Gra, like, like here, the, Baruch HaLevi Epstein said that this, this change, Mina Psachim Mina Zvachim, is actually rooted in a mistake, that there was some copyist that made himself a note on the margin of a Haggadah, and he wrote, you know, Bet Mem Shin, or Mem Shin Bet, the Mishnah Shebegmara, or the Mishnah as it appears in the Yerushalmi, is Mina Zvachim Mina Zvachim, Mina Psachim Mina Zvachim, with the Pesach first, as we saw, that's how the Mishnah, that's how the, the Yerushalmi records the Mishnah, and that gets misunderstood, that Mem Shin, or that Bet Mem Shin, gets misunderstood to be Bimotzei Shabbat, okay? It should have been the intent of that note was, no, this is the way the Mishnah appears in certain versions of the Bavli, or this is the way the Mishnah appears in the Yerushalmi, or this is the way uh, certain versions of the Mishnah has it, but no, that, that Mem Shin gets mistaken for Motzei Shabbat, that on Motzei Shabbat, you should flip the order, okay? And based on this, oh, the Marivail and others said, oh, you know, once it already, once this mistake, you know, uh, gets into the manuscripts uh, that, oh, this stands for Motzei Shabbat, on Motzei Shabbat, you have to flip the order. They read into that to mean that why, they give it an interpretation, that why do we make this change on Motzei Shabbat? Because you don't have the Chagigat Arba Asar. You're not going to eat the Zebach first. You're going to eat the Pesach first. So again, he and others say that this is all rooted in some mistake, some scribal error, that some copyist made himself a note in the margins, Mem Shin, to mean this is the way the Mishnah appears in the Yerushalmi or in other editions, and that got mistaken and misinterpreted to mean Bimotzei Shabbat, that you have to flip it on Motzei Shabbat. And then once <laughs> that mistake crept into manuscripts and proliferated, oh, all of a sudden they read some interpretation into it. They imbued some interpretation into it. Oh, you know why? You know why the Pesach comes first on Motzei Shabbat? Because we don't have the Chagigat Arba Asa. Okay. However, Rav Menachem Mental Kasher takes issue with, uh, with, with that suggestion. And uh, like in many places, he takes issue with, with the uh, Baruch Sha'amar, with Baruch HaLevi Epstein, the Baal Torah Tamima, you know, uh, the, the Baal Torah Tamima, Baruch HaLevi Epstein in his Torah Tamima on the Chumash said, you know, he was a, a businessman, but he also wrote Svarm. His, his most famous sefer is his commentary to the Chumash, the uh, Torah Tamima, where he gives you the Midrashim. So, you know, Rabbi Nachman in Kasher and his Torah Shlema also gives you the Midrashim, but a lot more Midrashim based on manuscript and based on his scholarship. And he often takes issue with the work and the scholarship of uh, Rabbi Baruch HaLevi Epstein. In any case, in a footnote there, he mentions this, uh, this whole analysis he mentions the uh, the Mari Vial, cites the Mari Vial, that on Motzei Shabbat, you flip the order, as we saw. 
And then he mentions the suggestion, how some suggest that this is all rooted in some mistake, in a misinterpretation of what Mem Shin stands for. And he doesn't like that. In a footnote here in source number 15, he writes the following. He says, no, that's... He doesn't like that suggestion. That's a big mistake, he writes. You don't find any other sources making mention of that. She'en kantot so fair. It's not a scribal error, he writes. She'en kantot so fair, cloud. Not at all. Not at all a scribal error. Ella, he explains, chidusho shel hamari vial. This is the chidush of the mari vial. That the mari vial introduced this idea that, you know, as I said, it, it's absent from the Mishnah, the Gemara, and, and all that we showed it. Even when the Tosos and Mordechai explain the reason for the order, they don't tell you that you should change the order on Motzei Shabbat. He says, this is the Chiddush of the Marival. The Marival came up with this Chiddush. And on Motzei Shabbat, you should, you should change the order. He says that you know, many editions of this, uh, of the Haggadah, make no mention of this at all. So, Rav Nachman Mendel Kasher, uh, was was not thrilled with the suggestion that it was rooted in a mistake. He believed that it was the Chiddush of the Mahari Vial. In any case, whether or not you say this, like uh, most Haggadot tell you to do, to, to change the order, whether or not on Motzei Shabbat at your Seder table, you're going to switch the order and say this year, Minas Vachim or you're going to pass it like uh, the Achronim that say that, you know, you don't have to change the order. This is this is uh, this nusach is to apply to, to most years, typical years. This nusach is looking towards the future when will be zocha to rejoice in the Beit Hamikdash and Lav Dafka is going to fall out of Motzei Shabbat. So even this year, you can say min ha zvachim u min ha psachim. Okay, min ha zvachim, or whether you here and say min ha psachim u min ha psachim, whatever you do, so long as that you know you have the right kavana that we should be zocha to eat from the korban pesach and uh, from the the other korbanot from the korban chagiga. That's what's important. I, and and I, I want to now uh, return with you to analyzing the role of this uh, bracha because you know it it, it has uh, a very important role, plays a, an essential role in the overall structure of the haggadah, as we'll uh, as we'll see now. Um, if we go back to the, the Mishnah here in source number two, the Mishnah actually presents this bracha as a machlok. The Mishnah first uh, begins by, by telling us that the context there in the 10th chapter of Pesachim is the Magid. We're talking about Magid. And then as part of Magid, we begin the, we begin the Hallel, right? We begin the Hallel. And what do we say? What do we say there? We say the first two, uh, the first, what, you say the first two paragraphs or first two mizmorim, first two chapters or first two, uh, two psalms of the Hallel, right? We say hallelujah and we say b'tzait Yisrael. And so Beit Hillel says we omrim ad chalamish l'mayno mayim, right? As part of the Magid, we end with the Hallel. We end the Magid with the first two mizmorim of Hallel, and we end with Chalamish l'mayno mayim, ve'chotam bigula, and this is so important, and that Hallel, or maybe that Magid portion, ends with Geula, with this blessing of redemption, the bracha of Asher Ge'alanu, okay? So again, we have the first part of the Haggadah, we have Magid, we tell the story of the exodus from Egypt, we begin the Hallel, we say the first two prakim or mizmorim of Hallel, and then we end it, the chotam, there's a chatima with geula. We end it with this bracha of asher ge'alanu, and then of course we, we uh, enjoy the second cup of wine. Okay, we're gonna come back to that point and we'll see the role it plays with, uh, with, uh, with Hallel and with the Magir, and, and then with the overall structure of the Haggadah. But the text of the bracha is actually a machloket. It's a machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Tarfon says simply the bracha should be Asher ge'alanu ve'ge'alat avotenu mimitzrayim. Period. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech olam asher ge'alanu ve'ge'alat avotenu mimitzrayim. A short blessing. Ve'lo haya chotem. And he doesn't have a chatima. There's no end blessing. There's no baruch atah Hashem ge'al Yisrael according to Rabbi Tarfon. It's a very, very short blessing. That's how Rabbi Tarfon understands the blessing that should be made. 
However, Rabbi Akiva Omer, Rabbi Akiva has a much more expansive version of this blessing. He says, Cain, so too, Hashem Elokeinu, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You should bring us to the Beit HaMikdash, as we said, and there we should we should uh, be zochet to celebrate together uh, in in the in the rebuilt city of Jerusalem and the base of Mikdash and do the avoda the simcha the sasam sasim of etc etc etc. So so there uh, you have a, a much more expansive blessing and Rabbi Akiva ends with a chatima baruch atah Hashem gaal Yisrael. Okay, blessed are you Hashem who gaal Yisrael. Who has redeemed Israel? So, what is the nature of this machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva? What's the nature of that machloket? What are they really arguing on? They give two different versions of what this blessing should be, two different nuschaot. What should the matbe'ah of this bracha be? So, if you take a look at Tosfos and the Rajbam there, I put it here in source numbers uh, 16 and 17. So Tosos and Rashbam explain that, they actually explain it's very technical. You know, there's certain types of blessings, or or different, as as you all know, different different types of blessings. So what Tosos and Rashbam explain is that the machloket is about what type of blessing it should be where according to Rabbi Tarfon, it's a simple blessing without a chatima. And Tosos and the Rashbam explain, that's like a, a, a blessing of thanks, thanksgiving, hoda'ah. Okay, that's, that's hoda'ah. And Tosos and the Rashbam explain that hoda'ah doesn't need a chatima. Like when you thank Hashem, you know, Tosos gives the example, uh, Rashbam gives the example of, you know, just eating, you're eating something. Like you're eating, you're eating a, a fruit or something. You know, uh, Rashbam says here, you know, like on, on a, a birkat perot, right? Birkat a mitzvot. You, you make a bracha before eating a fruit or before performing a mitzvah, and you want to give thanks to Hashem. It's a short bracha. It doesn't have a chatima. Okay, so that's Rabbi Tarfon. Rabbi Tarfon understands this bracha to be a bracha of hoda'a, of thanks. However, Rabbi Akiva chotemba, nami bibaruch. But Rabbi Kiva, as we saw, gives a chatima. Why? Because it's a different type of blessing. The nature of the blessing is different. Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva, chotem ba nami b'baruch. Why? Lefish emosif ba divrei ritzui ubakasha. Because for Rabbi Kiva, it's not a birkat hoda'a. It's not giving thanks to Hashem. It's not only. It's not only about giving thanks, but it's also a bracha of ritzui and bakasha. It's a request, and a request, as you know from. Brachot from Tfilot, a request has a chatima, has an end blessing to it. Okay, there's the beginning, the pticha, and a chatima. So Tosos and the Rashbam explain that the nature, the Nikudata Nachlok, the nature of the dispute between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva is what type of blessing are we talking about? Is it a blessing where we're giving hoda'a, where we're thanking Hashem, that's Rabbi Tarfon, and therefore it's just a short blessing? Thank you, Hashem, for redeeming our, our, us and our forefathers, the Kuda from Egypt, period. Or, according to Rabbi Akiva, this blessing is a bakasha. It's actually a request. It's a, it's a tefillah, right? And therefore, it requires a chatima. It's a more expansive bracha. And in addition to thanking Hashem, there's also an element of ritsui and bakasha. So therefore, it requires a chatima. So that's the machloket, as Tosfot and the Rashbam. But what are they really arguing about, right? So if you boil it down to one word, the nature of this blessing, is this blessing about the past? It would sound like, according to Rabbi Tarfon, this blessing is about the past, right? We're thanking Hashem for taking us out of Egypt in the past. And for Rabbi Akiva, this blessing is looking towards the future and therefore, it's a bakasha. It's a request of Hashem that requires a chatima. It's a request that we should be zocha to serve Hashem with joy in the Beit HaMikdash and eat from the Zvachim and eat from the Psachim. Or eat from the Psachim and the Zvachim. And so if you take a look, the element, right? 
to Hashem, we should, you should bring us to, to and bring us to your Beit HaMikdash and we should serve you there. Enjoy. That's that pivotal word for Rabbi Akiva. So really this machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva is, is whether this blessing is about the past, we're thanking Hashem for the past, or Rabbi Akiva adds this element that we're looking towards the future. Okay, we're looking towards the future. Now it's interesting, if you look at the Rambam, I think the Rambam was also sensitive to this machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva. And now, by the way, we'll see that, that we actually incorporate. Now, Tosfos here says that the halacha is like Rabbi Akiva. Right? Halacha Rabbi Akiva, mi ro. When there's machloket, we pass like Rabbi Akiva, mi uh, That's a whole discussion as to what that means. But I, I think the Rambam was also sensitive Machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva, and this tension between past and, and future. And the Rambam here in source number 18, he gives you the first part of the bracha, Asher Galanu, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, Ubizman hazemosif. And nowadays, when we don't have a Beit HaMikdash, you should add, right? Hashem, et cetera, et cetera. Bring us to uh, future festivals and we should be selling our holy temple and your rebuilt city, et cetera, et cetera. And with those three words, the Rambam, I mean, it's just so, so incredible what he writes. Uh, those three little words in the Rambam, every, every word is precious in the Rambam. When you study the Rambam, you have to you know, be medayik in his lashon and, and look at his lashon so carefully and, and be medayik every word. But those three words, it, it's so telling. He's saying that the, this is the machloka between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva adds this element of the future. Right? We should be zoche to serve Hashem in the base of Migdash with, with joy. He says, Bismana Zen, now that we don't have a holy temple. Okay. Now it's interesting, the Rajba, based on Yerushalmi, in uh, the Rajba's commentary to Masechet Brachot, he says this explicitly based on Yerushalmi and how the Yerushalmi. Shami, he brings a passage from the Yushami, which he believes is a reference to this bracha here, and how uh, the machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Kiva is about past versus future. That Rabbi Tarfon is saying this bracha is thanking Hashem for the past, for the exodus from Egypt, whereas Rabbi Akiva is adding this element of the future. And the Rambam so beautifully writes here, Ubizmana Zemosif. Nowadays, without a Beit Hamikdash, you have to add this, this uh, additional element which Rabbi Akiva adds. And I think it's, it's so significant that it's Dafka Rabbi Akiva who adds this nusa. It's Rabbi Akiva that looks towards the future because who was Rabbi Akiva after all? Rabbi Akiva is the sage who possesses that strength of spirit, that courage to go on after the Hurban. In fact, there's a very famous question. Why all those sages, right? Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Elizabeth Azari, Rabbi Rabbi Tarfon, right? Rabbi Tarfon as well. Why they were reclining in B'nai Brak. We sit in the Haggadah that all these rabbis were reclining in B'nai Brak and they were discussing in the Exodus from Egypt the entire night until their students came and told them, rabbis, it's time to recite the morning Shema. And, and, and the famous question is why Dafka B'nai Brak? The Gemara in Sanhedrin says that B'nai Brak was Rabbi Akiva's city. And so the choice of B'nai Brak is curious as Rabbi Akiva was the junior of the group all the others being his teachers, being older than him. And the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah and Sukkah says, The student is supposed to visit his Rebbe on the Regel, not the other way around. So Rabbi Kiva should have traveled his teachers. Why are they celebrating with him in his city in B'nai Brak? Why did they need to be with Rabbi Akiva? So I think it's obvious. In one word, hope. Right, following uh, the Churban, the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, these, these rabbis, these sages were crushed. Their hopes and dreams were, were crushed, were destroyed. And only Rabbi Akiva could provide them with the hope and courage necessary to go on, to move forward. And it's Dafka Rabbi Tarfon that's there with him in Ibn Abra. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Now, you know that. You know, many, many uh, passages in the Talmud uh, talk about Rabbi Akiva's tremendous positivity, Right, how he would always say, "Kol David Rachman Tava the Gemara and Brachot, of course, everything that Hashem does is for the best. And the Gemara in uh, Yivamot, which relates how all of his students died in one fell swoop between Pesach and Shavuot, between Pesach and Atzeret, right? 24,000 students. And he had the courage and the fortitude to go down to the rabbis of the South and raise up new students and to replenish all the Torah that had been lost. The world was shamim, the Gemara says. The world was empty, devoid of Torah. 
And, and we know that Rabbi Kiva has the strength of spirit and, and uh, we're all familiar with that, that story that appears at the very end of Masechet Makot, one of the uh, most famous stories perhaps in the entire Talmud. How, uh, you know, they, 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 almost the same group, by the way, that was reclining in Bnei Brak, they're standing there on Haaretz Sofim and they're looking over and they see that uh, the Beit HaMikdash, the, the, the Harabai is completely, completely destroyed, it's plowed under, and there's a fox that's, that's traipsing on the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, the Sanctum Sanctorum, where you know, only the Kohen Gadol could go only one day a year on the holiest day of the year on Yom Kippur. And so the sages begin to cry, and Rabbi Kiva, of course, as you know, begins to laugh, and they ask him, why do you laugh? And he says, why do you cry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the, the gist of it is that Rabbi Akiva says, just as the prophecies of destruction have been fulfilled, so too the prophecy and the promise of redemption will be fulfilled. And the story ends with those four powerful words. The rabbis say to him, Akiva nichamtanu, Akiva nichamtanu, you've comforted us, Akiva. You've comforted us, Akiva. But what's interesting is that uh, one of the psukim that is cited there to describe the fulfillment of the prophecy, the prophecy of, of Micha, one of the psukim that is describing the state that the Temple Mount was in at the time is a pasuk from Micha Perik Gimel, the third chapter of Micha, Lachin Biglalchem Tzion Sade Techaresh. Tzion Sade Techaresh, because of you, Tzion, Zion, the, the field of Zion will be plowed under. And, and that, uh, the Gemara explains, was the state of the Temple Mount at that time. It was completely plowed under, okay? So uh, what's interesting is the, the Pasuk there uses this Lashon of Techaresh, of plowing. And Rabbi Akiva was able to see the Zriya, the seeding that takes place right after the Harisha. You know, from the uh, 39 Mulachot, Mulachot Shabbat, from Mulachot Shabbat, there's two types of Harisha. There's the plowing that takes place before seeding and, and after the seeding. Rabbi Akiva saw that this plowing, that the fact that the Temple Mount was, was plowed under, he was able to see the Zriya that is already taking place, the seed of redemption that was already being sown. So it's Dafka Rabbi Akiva, it's so significant, I think, that it's Dafka Rabbi Akiva who is the one who teaches this Nusach HaBracha, this addition, this, this cane. Therefore, we should be Zoha to celebrate together in Yerushalayim and the rebuilt Yerushalayim and to rejoice in the Beit HaMikdash and eat from the Korbanot. It's Dafka Rabbi Akiva. And so this machloket between Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Rabbi Tarfon, was a little older than Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Tarfon, we know from passages in the Gemara, served as a Kohen in the Beit HaMikdash. And while they had this talent Chave relationship, Rabbi Tarfon was older than Rabbi Akiva. So it could be that Rabbi Tarfon is speaking to the past. Rabbi Tarfon here, when he suggests that the Nusach of the Bracha should be Asher Ge'alanu, the Galat Avotenu, Mimitzrayim, that's about the past, when we had a Beit HaMikdash. However, it's Dafka Rabbi Akiva that comes along and says, no, we have to also speak to the future. We have to speak to the future. And this bracha, this bracha would seem, if you analyze it carefully, and we'll end with this idea, this bracha seems to conflate the past with the present and the future. Because even the way Rabbi Tarfon formulates the bracha. It's Asher Ge'alanu, the Ge'alat Avotenu Mitzrayim. It's not Asher Ge'alat Avotenu Mitzrayim. Hashem, blessed are you, you redeemed our forefathers. No, no, no. It's you've redeemed us and our forefathers. Then Rabbi Tarfon recognizes that there is an element of the present that must be mentioned. Okay, why? Because Chayav Adam Lirotet Atzmok Yiluhu Yatsami Mitzrayim. Because at the Seder table, each and every one of us has to feel as if we're leaving Egypt right now, okay? And so the way we have this bracha, right? We, we accept both the, like Tosfa says, we pass on like Rabbi Akiva with the chatima, but we begin the bracha like Rabbi Tarfon and we continue with Rabbi Akiva's uh, addition, speaking to the future, because the Seder night is all about past, present, and future. And you see this in this blessing itself. This blessing confuses and conflates the past with the present and the future. Okay, so we, we begin with the past and the present, and then we move with this addition. You know, Cain, therefore, Hashem, bring us to the future, bring us to your base. That makes us we move towards the future. And what's fascinating is how do we end the bracha? What is the chatima of the bracha? 
even according to Rabbi Akiva, who's focused on the future, who adds this element of the future. But even according to Rabbi Akiva, the Chatima is the past. It's Baruch HaTashem Ga'al Yisrael. And the Gemara says this clearly here in, in source number 19. Okay, the Gemara says that uh, the Chotem Geula, like the Mishnah says, you have to end this, this passage, the Hallel, the Magid, and then the Hallel, you end with the, bless, the blessing of redemption. Amar um, Rava, Rava said, Kriyat Shema Behalel, when you say the bracha of Ga'al Yisrael in Kriyat Shema, one of the Birkot, Kriyat Shema, the blessings of the Shema, and in the Hallel, which Hallel? That's the Hallel of Erev Pesach, Rashbam explains, right? You say Ga'al Yisrael in past tense. Did slota, but when you pray in your Amidah, then you say in the present tense, go El Yisrael. So it's interesting. We end off on Ga'al Yisrael. We end off in the past. Okay? We end off in the past. And the Rafim says this clearly. When you daven in your Amidah, then Sha'anamit Palim al Hatid. Anamit Palim al you're looking towards the future. But in the Hallel of the night of Pesach, right? We end with the past, we end with Gal Yisrael. So this blessing of, it conflates and confuses the past with the present and the future, okay? And even according to Rabbi Kiva, who's focused on the future and, and, and wants to return to the base of English, is able to see the seed of redemption already planted in the destruction. But even, even he, we return to Gal Yisrael. So what is this blessing doing and, and um, there's, a, there's a lot more to say but we're, uh, we're out of time already but there's a, a whole discussion in the Rishonim as to uh, this phrase here uh, there are some additions that have it as, as we say right when do we say that we say that uh, we say that before we begin the halal Right? We have this lefichach that we say, this paragraph of lefichach, anu chayavim, anachnu chayavim, etc., etc. And we end off in Omar Lafanav, Shira Chadasha. So, so some explain that that too is rooted in whether this blessing is about the past or about the future. I mean, we're out of time, I don't have time to get into it. But um, some explain based on a midrash that Shir Chadash is future. Shira Chadasha is past. We're thinking Hashem for the past. And Shira Chadasha is in the feminine. Shir Chadash is in the masculine. So some bring the Midrash, which explains the difference that Shira Chadasha is in the feminine. It refers to the birth pangs of the Messiah, the Chevle Mashiach. It's in the feminine. It refers to the pain that the mother goes through when she's pregnant. It refers to the, the uh, Chevle Mashiach, whereas here, the future deliverance, says the Midrash, is going to be a shir chadash in, ma- in the masculine, all right, in the masculine without any more birth pangs. The birth pangs of the Messiah, that's already in the past. But now we're speaking about redemption. We're speaking about future, and therefore it's shir chadash. There's a lot more to say on this point, um, but uh, we're out of time. But uh, just to end with this, this bracha, which confuses and conflates past with present and future, Okay, if you take a look at where it's positioned, it's positioned so well in the Haggadah, okay, uh, right after Magid. Okay, in fact, that's what the Mishnah says, that you're, you, you, you say the Magid, you say, you begin the first two paragraphs of the Hallel, and then you end it off, your Chotem, with this bracha of Geula. Chotem de Geula. Okay, so what's interesting is there's actually a, um, a uh, discussion, there's a whole discussion, in the, um, in the Rishonim already, and the Achronim, as to why there is no special blessing for the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Here we have this mitzvah, which we observe one night a year at the Seder, the mitzvah of Vihigarata Levincha. It's a mitzvah, Min Torah to relate the story of the Exodus from Egypt, but yet there's no blessing associated with this mitzvah. Right? If you're observing a mitzvah, there should be a blessing. So the Rishon and the Achronim, they offer all different, different suggestions as to you know, why there is no blessing, or maybe that there is a blessing, but what blessing is it that we do say, right? And, and where do we say it? But, uh, you know, Lichora, there is no blessing. But there is an opinion that's recorded in the Shita Mikubet set that this bracha of Asher Ge'alanu is the bracha over the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We make Asher Ge'alanu 
at the end of Magid, but that is the bracha on the Magid. That is the bracha on Sipri Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Okay? And so then the question is, the Shita Megubetz asks, but so why is it at the end of the Magid? Shouldn't it be at the beginning of the Magid? Normally we make a bracha over la asiatan before performing a mitzvah. So why are you now saying a bracha? You're backtracking. You're saying a bracha after you've already fulfilled the mitzvah. No, so Shita Megubetz explains, it's not because the Mishnah tells us, matchil beginut umesayim b'shevach. We have to begin uh, with negative, something negative, whether that's that our forefathers were idolaters or that we were slaves in Egypt. We have to begin by looking at the bad stuff. And then we end off with shevach. So therefore the blessing is at the end because this blessing is all about what? This blessing is all about future and hope. And, and it ends off on, on something positive. So you want to be Messiah b'shevach. You want to end off on something positive. So it says the Shita Mikubetzet. So the Magid, which the, the focus of the Magid is on the past, on the shibud, on the, the pain, on the servitude and the, the slavery in Egypt, and therefore this blessing, which is about hope and redemption, so that comes at the end. Okay, so what you see is that this blessing is so is so uh, important. It's right there. It's pivotal. It it's placed there right in the middle of the Haggadah, and it, it's this transition, this blessing, which itself conflates past, present, and future, as we've seen. It also would be this transition between the first half of the Haggadah and the second half. The first half of the Seder, which focuses on the exodus from Egypt, and the second half of the Seder, which focuses on the future redemption, the final redemption. Okay, And you see, also based on its placement, it's placed right after the first two paragraphs, or first two mizmorim of Hallel. And the question is asked, why do we split up Hallel in the Haggadah? Well, we have a mitzvah to say Hallel at, uh, at the Seder, okay? And the Hallel is supposed to accompany the Korban Pesach, but why do we split it up? That's very strange. And how do you split it up, right? Are you allowed to make a hefsek in Hallel? Very strange. So some explain, okay, because, you know, we, we, we split it up. It's allowed, you know, there's this allowance to split it up to make a hefsek in order to eat the Korban Pesach. Nowadays, we don't have the Korban Pesach, so we eat the matzah, the afikomen, which represents the Korban Pesach. So that's what allows us to, to make a break. But why? Why have a break, right? Why have a break? Why... Uh, so again, it's because it's supposed to accompany the Korban Pesach, but at least thematically, why is there a break? Is it because, you know, we're so hungry? All right, enough already. Enough, enough Magid, enough Sipur, enough singing, let's eat already. Why do we stop in the middle? So the Abravanel in his famous Haggadah Zevach Pesach explains, because if you take a look carefully, the first half of Hallel, those first two paragraphs, or Mizmorim that we say, is all about the exodus from Egypt. The second half of Hallel is all about the future and final redemption, okay? And what do we have right in the middle? What closes off the Magid section? What is the Chatima? What closes off the Hallel, right? Or the first two paragraphs of Hallel? The Bracha of Asher Ge'alan. So we have the first half of the Seder, which focuses on the past, Okay, and then we say Hallel, Hallel Mitzri, as it's called, Hallel about Mitzrayim, the first two paragraphs that focus on the Exodus from Egypt. Okay, and then we end with this blessing, okay, which connects the past with the present and the future. And the rest of the Haggadah, if you take a look, is all about the future, right? What do we do? We, we okay, we, we eat, we've got, we got dinner, right? And then we, we, uh, we bench, we eat the afikom and we bench. But then what do we do? We open the door for Eliyahu and, and all, all of the, the rest of the Haggadah, all of these, these things that we say, it's all about the future and final redemption, right? Even these silly songs at the end of the Haggadah, we end off with this very silly song of Chad Gadya, which is really not so silly, which is actually, if you examine it closely, very profound. Unfortunately, by Chad Gadya, most people are either drunk or asleep. Um, but Chad Gadya is so profound. We, we speak about different nations throughout Jewish history that try to swallow us up like the cat swallows up the goat, right? And, uh, and the dog and then all these different nations. And then finally, it ends with the, the ghoul, the final redemption, Mashiach, how Kodesh Baruch Hu is going to slaughter uh, the the Malach uh, Hamavit Bilat Hamavit Lanetzach. There's no longer going to be death. Bilat Hamavit Lanetzach. It's it's about redemption. Okay, so the second half of the Seder, if you look carefully at the Haggadah, it's all about redemption. But the truth is, <laughs> it's not so precise because the entire Haggadah, if it were uh, so to speak, conflates past, present, and future. We begin the Haggadah. Right? With what? We begin the Haggadah with Halach Ma'anya, 
we're speaking about the bread of affliction, we begin in the language of Aramaic, which is the language of exile, the language of Galut Bavel, okay? And we say, Hashtahacha, now we are here, L'shana Haba, next year, we will be Bnei Chori. Next year with the Beit HaMikdash, hopefully we will be free men. So even the first part of the Haggadah is not solely focused on the past, on the exodus from Egypt, but it's also focused on the final redemption. You've got many, many examples of uh, how even the first half of the Haggadah has elements of, of longing towards the future of the final redemption, of the final Geula. And it's easy to understand why that is. Because Chayav Adam li rotet atzmok ilu yatsami mitzrayim, as Rabbi Gamliel teaches us in the Mishnah, we have to feel as if we too are leaving Egypt, and it's very difficult for us to access those feelings. We're supposed to experience the pain and the suffering, uh, the shibud, the avodat parech, the, the servitude, and the bondage in Egypt, and the hard labor and the bitterness. We're supposed to feel that and experience that and taste that, but we're also supposed to experience and taste freedom, and taste redemption, okay? And so how do we do that? How do we access those feelings? You'd say, Mitzrayim happened so long ago. We access those feelings and emotions, and we access that experience by relating to our current exile. We relate to the exile and the pain and bondage of servitude in Egypt by relating to our current exile. And we experience the joy and the freedom by relating to the future and final redemption. And so there's so much in the Haggadah and so much in the Seder that conflates past, present, and future. Even these symbols, you know, the matzah and the maror and the haroset and, and the wine, you know, it, it, and, and, and the leaning and the dipping, it, it conflates, you know, what, what are we tonight? What are we? Are we, are we? are we free men, right? Or are we slaves, right? Which one is it? And the answer is it's both. You can, you know, the, the four questions, which you can boil down to, you know, to, to one word each, right? right? Matzah, maror, dipping, reclining. But the common denominator is really one question. Why the mixed symbolism? And the answer is because tonight we are both slaves and have to go through that experience and feel that and, and taste the bitterness and leave Egypt, okay? But also experience the freedom and taste the freedom. And we do that by focusing on the past, the present, and the future. And we do that with this bracha, the birkat ha'ke'ula, the bracha v'asher ge'alanu, which conflates the past with the present and the future and is placed right there, right at the end of Magid. It ends off the Magid. It ends off those first two paragraphs of Hallel, which focus on Yitzhak Mitzrayim. This blessing, which conflates past, present, and future, it, it is this transition. Okay, it moves the Seder along. Even the Seder that, that conflates past with present and future, but the first half, the focus is really on Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And then we have this blessing, which then moves us towards the future and final redemption. And I think this blessing is really so, so uh, relevant and, and resonates really with us. Uh, those of us who I said at the beginning of this year are fortunate to have witnessed the miraculous birth of the state of Israel and all the nisim and all the niflaot, all the wonders and miracles. Ashrei ayin ratazot. Fortune is the eye who has witnessed this, who has seen this. I mean, we, we live during exceptional times and this blessing, which focuses on the past and the present and the future, I think we can really relate to it. Right? Here we are in the present and we live during difficult times challenging times, but we also live during very, very exciting times. We live at a unique moment in history, and we have to remember that at our Seder table. I wish you all a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. We should be Zoha, like the Bracha of Asher Galanu uh, tells us, like we'll be saying on Motzei Shabbat, we should be Zoha to rejoice together in the rebuilt city of Jerusalem, rejoice together in joy in the Beit HaMikdash, performing Hashem's service, and there we will eat from the Pesachim and from the Zvachim, or this year from the Zvachim and from the Pesachim. Chag Kasher V'Sameach.